Welcome again to another edition of Paying It Forward, Paying It Back. I'm Dave Gore, an executive director of the National Sports Media Association. Thank you to our sponsors of this series, Greater Winston-Salem, Inc. And welcome to our guest panelists today, Gary Washburn of the Boston Globe, Eric Hall of USA Today, and Lauren Sisler of every media outlet known to man and woman, AL.com, ESPN, SEC Network. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you to the rest of you for being here as well. Um, I want to start out by just explaining our voting process, because as you might imagine, and I've talked to a couple people among you that I get questions every year. How does it work? How can I nominate? Do you have to be a member to win? Do you have to be a member to vote? So I'll, I'll go through that first and uh, see if we can perfect the uh, screen share here. So this is how our nomination process works. Our process begins on October 15th each year. I email out to all of our members a basically fill in the blank online ballot and ask them to nominate up to three people each for their state sportscaster of the year, their state sports writer of the year, the national sportscaster of the year, and the national sports writer of the year. That nomination balloting ends on November 15th. Uh, whoops. So for the state awards, the top two vote getters plus any ties go on the final ballot. For the national awards, the top 10 vote getters and any ties go on the final ballot. For the Hall of Fame finals, I consult with our current Hall of Famers. I always say our living Hall of Famers, but it really wouldn't make, make a whole lot of sense if it were the dead ones, would it now? Um, consult with them. I send a list of the people who've been on the ballot in the past who obviously have not gotten in. I have some, several other names and I ask for suggestions from the Hall of Famers on other names to be placed on the final ballot and then um, see who gets the most votes there. And those 10 finalists, sportscaster and sports writer, each go on the final ballot. Then December 1st, I email the link to the final ballot and members have until the end of the year, December 31st, to make their selections one each in their state, one sportscaster, one sports writer, same for national and same for Hall of Fame. Those votes are tallied automatically through Constant Contact, which is the email marketing system we use. Um, basically just use their poll, um, the poll that they have and am able to build a ballot out of that. So who is eligible to vote? All NSMA members in these categories. Premier, which is our main category of working uh, sports media, Lifetime, and then AIPS, which is the French acronym for the International Sports Press Association. Uh, most of those people don't participate in the voting. They are interested only in getting their international accreditation and have to go through us in this country. Uh, student members aren't eligible, but we tell student chapters that they can have one vote, the chapter, so that kind of encourages them to um, study who their people in their state are and the National and Hall of Fame people and they get one vote as a chapter. Friends of NSMA, which is basically just an I want to support the organization without really participating uh, membership, also not eligible. Who's eligible to win? Anyone working in sports media for any portion of the year. So anybody who worked in sports media in 2020, in 2020 was eligible. It includes people who have retired or passed away during the calendar year. Now we get into discussing diversity of the awards. A little bit of history for you. Total number of people in our Hall of Fame is 119. Total people of color in the Hall of Fame is three. And as you can see, the very first one was just three years ago, Sam Lacey. We've, we've had one each year with Brian Gumbel and Michael Wilbon the last two years. Total number of people of color to win the national award, just one, Mike Tirico in 2010. Total number of women in the Hall of Fame, four. Sally Jenkins was first in 05, followed by Mary Garber uh, in 2008. Leslie Wh Visser in 2015 and Linda Cohn in 2017. 
Only one woman has won a national award. That was Doris Burke in 2018. Uh, this year by the numbers, total nomination votes were a little over 900. National sportscasters who received at least one vote, 146. National sports writers who received at least one vote, 220. People of color among the Hall of Fame finalists, James Brown, Tom Jackson on the sportscaster side, William C. Roden, Claire Smith, who's the only woman finalist, and Wendell Smith, those five out of 20 of the Hall of Fame finalists. Uh, national finalists, people of color, Mike Tirico, the only one, and three women among them, uh, Doris Burke, Nicole Auerbach, and Christine Brennan. 2020 state finalists, there were a total of 292, and the total number, people of color is actually nine. I just added, thanks to James, I didn't realize, uh, Brian Henshin in South Dakota is Asian American, but as you can see, the percentage is only 2.7%. So David Aldridge, Brian Henshin, Brian Harris, Rick Henry, Dylan Hernandez, Tony Jones, Otis Livingston, Dave Sims, Van Tate, I believe that's six sportscasters and three sports writers. And so those are the numbers, and I figured that would be a good way to open up our discussion. Um, I'll throw it open to any of our pot, uh, any of our panelists. Gary, Lauren, um, Eric, if you want to weigh in, and uh, I didn't mention L LGBTQ. Uh, Eric, I know has been a big proponent, has, has written for several publications, and. Uh, he and I have been in touch on it a little bit. Um, so I'll throw it open. Gary, I know you had contacted me a couple of years ago. That started our discussion. Um, and, and, you know, I struggle with sometimes how do you, how, how do we increase the diversity, not only among the award winners, but among our membership as well? Uh, well, one, you need to promote uh partner with uh, the National Association of Black Journalists and the other minority journalist organizations to get increased membership. But the problem is, seems to me, is the nominations. Um, you know, you literally have like, you know, three black sports writers in the country being nominated for an award. Like you have no African-Americans or people of color in California, Massachusetts, or New York. Like there's a lot of people of color who write sports Mm -hmm. And I and I don't know about uh, broadcasters, but I think it's the same thing. Like, there's basically white people voting for white people and nominating white people, and that's the problem. And people are nominating their friends. They're nominating the same person who won the year before. They don't look at their resume of what they've done that year. They just say, "Oh yeah, they're a good writer. Let me nominate them for sports writer of the year, like or sports caster of the year." Like, we're not looking at, we're not we're not doing the research where you know, a, lot, a lot of the membership is nominating their friends or people they're comfortable with. There's no way that there should be no people of color in, in some of these states that have a vast, I mean, maybe I can understand, uh, you know, the Dakotas or Montana or Idaho or something like that, but California, Massachusetts, uh, New York, uh, you know, Florida, like it's, it's absurd. So there has to be some type of system to get people to stop nominating their buddies and people that they, 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 they have great, you know, these people have great reputations. It's nothing bad about nominating, but you've got to mix it up a little bit. I mean, literally we've got to, we've got to have some type of, uh, you know, system where people are, are being considered who are not being considered now. Um, and then that turns off people of color who look and go, I have no chance. Why, why should I join an organization where, I have no chance to win an award and neither does anyone that I, uh, any of my colleagues of color. Why should I join that? So you've got, I mean, I've had discussions with colleagues of mine. Why, what, why would I join that? You know, black people don't win. I mean, you literally have like the first black hall of famer was three years ago. Like, so we just started, we just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted at that three years ago. I mean, the first, like, I don't know, maybe it's me, but, you know, 
there's been a lot of black uh, African Americans and people of color who have made major impacts in this business before 2017. And, you know, but yet we have someone like Nicole Auerbach, who's amazing. She's, I think she's 30 and she's up for, you know, and, but, but Claire Smith is not in the Hall of Fame. You know, like, what, do, like, who's, who's, you know, like Claire Smith, who's been in the press box since 1979. Like, what are we, what are we doing here? Like, what, like, I, I'm just confused. And I think that there's, like, we've got to stop nominating our buddies and people we're comfortable with and people, we, we know them and, and they've been, well, they've won it 11 years in a row. Like, like, I've been in Massachusetts. Jan Shaughnessy has won 12 Sports Writer of the Year awards. Like, there's a lot of talent in Massachusetts. And I love Dan. Dan does a great job. It's nothing against Dan. I mean, but um, Dan's putting these trophies like so, in some little dresser drawer now. He just, oh, this is great. Thanks. I mean, is that what we want? Now, if the person is just absolutely dominating his field or her, I get it. But there's got to be some type of situation where we get people who we get some new names, some fresh faces, some people who have who are doing very good work out here because we're not. <laughs> and now, just Dave, a little, uh, go ahead, Eric. Could you speak to, I think you, there was a change in how you selected the Hall of Fame because I think it used to be open for nomination and in the last couple of years it may have changed. So it's, it's not as open a ballot for the. Yeah, I think it's gone back and forth over the years. Uh, so the Hall of, you know, the organization was founded in 1959. First Hall of Famer was 1962. And for the first 10 years or so, it was one person a year. And then, the, then it was one sportscaster, one sports writer. So as, as you might imagine, if you go back in time, trying to get one a year, you're never going to get everybody in. I took over as executive director in 2009. And in two, I think it was 2010, so my first year working, first full year working here, uh, we had a situation where, where it was a four vote difference between first and second for Hall of Fame sportscaster. So I sent an email to current Hall of Famers and said, what would you think of putting both of them in? Thinking everyone's gonna say, oh yeah, no problem. And I actually, believe it or not, got some pushback from people who said, Oh, you're watering it down. And, you know, that's, that's a good reason to keep people out of your exclusive club. And that's not something I'm interested in doing. So gradually, we, we, we went to three or four or two of each. And, you know, there are still a lot of people who are deceased who, in my opinion, belong in the Hall of Fame. So last year, we had six. And so that's my goal is to keep it a... a a handful a year, um, and I, I think that's going to help. Um, but I'm certainly open to all kinds of suggestions. One thing, first of all, I want to say that I'm openly gay. I'm a member of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association National Board, so that's why I've been included on this panel. Um, I'm. I'm not sure the guidance on how you select somebody is clear when you're at the nominating stage. And that could be something to change because particularly when I look, worked in Virginia for a couple of years, it seemed like it just went back and forth between a couple people basically as a career award. Um, and is that what it's supposed to be? Is it supposed to be like recognition of a career or what their work in the past year? And I think past a lot year. of, yeah, and I think a lot of the nomination is career recognition, or at least in, in some states. So you think it'd be helpful if we've laid that out? People yeah, who's worked in this year. Yeah, because I, I, I've, I've felt particularly like when I was working in Virginia, like people were getting recognized that weren't doing good work that year. They had earlier in their career, but um, yeah. Rob Jay, let me ask you, you, you've won the award. Um, you're in Mississippi, a little bit different than South Dakota where James is. Um, your, your thoughts on this. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, what Gary said when, when it comes to, you know, nominating their friends and, and all of this, because we have several uh, black guys here in Mississippi and Jackson and 
all across the state who are sports writers, but every year it seems as though it's the same sports writer who, who was nominated. And, and, and that's because everybody knows this guy. And uh, his name is he's Rick Cleveland. He's, he's, he's great. But uh, there are other guys who I think deserve to be nominated. You know, uh, I nominated a, a guy this year, an African-American guy who I think is a really, really good sports writer here in, in Mississippi. But um, what's his name? Of, sorry. What's his name? Uh, his name is Wilton Jackson. Wilton Jackson. And um, he went to Jackson State and um, he, he's now a sports writer here. So. I just think it's uh, getting with the NAB, NA, NABJ is a great, great, great idea mm -hmm. uh, to partner with them and to, you know, and that way you can find out more about, who, you know, who are the sports writers, African-American and the, and the minority sports writers and sportscasters in the state. So then the other question, is, okay, there are 300 plus people voting. How do you instruct, I guess we have to educate them or give them instructions saying, kind of laying it out. Don't just vote the same without, you can't tell people you have to vote for so-and-so or you don't vote. Uh, I have put in there, don't vote for friends, vote vote to recognize excellence. Well, Dave, um, why don't you, it could be a situation where you have people submit work so people have access to someone's work. I mean, there's people who do amazing stories uh, throughout the country who don't get recognized. And then you got guys like Rob was referring to who just have a great reputation. Maybe they just didn't have a great year. Maybe they had a good year, but maybe this one writer or, or, or sportscaster went above and beyond. Maybe they, you know, went, did amazing work and were, you know, maybe if we submitted their work, their work was submitted, right. people, you know, because you're asking voters to do their own research and, people are too busy to do that. They're just going to be like, oh, uh, let me go. Okay, let me go a couple of here. Yeah, they're going to vote in 10 minutes. So if you have some links to their work or mm -hmm. a link to some sound bites, if they do TV or radio, and you could hear or see or read what they do, I think that would help because this is the situation is the people who are doing amazing work and then they don't get nominated, so they get discouraged, and they're like, "Eff it! I'm not. I'm not going to like. Why should I be part of this? I don't want to be part of this, you right. know? Because there's people telling me it's just a bunch of white guys, you know. And I can't argue. I cannot argue when the five finalists for Sports Writer of the Year are all from the Boston Globe, where I work, which is great. Hey, mm -hmm. but my goodness, all from the Boston Globe, they're all white. Like, there's there's the Boston Herald, there's Springfield Paper, there's all types of small publications throughout Massachusetts doing good work on um, websites and all five finalists are from the globe and all are white. Like that's not diversity, including Dan Shaughnessy, who I love, but he's going for number 13. So, I mean, it, it, there's gotta be a level of like preparedness that they have, that the voters have, and we've got to make it easy on them in terms of like, here's some links to some work from, the, from your home state that you might not have noticed because there's all types of great stories being done in small cities all over the states that we live in. High score, stories on high school kids. Uh, you know, every, you know, let's be honest, ha most of our high school kids playing sports have some kind of amazing story. It's right. not like, the, this is not leave it to Beaver anymore. Like these guys, gals are, are going through all types of stuff to play, family situations. We need to get those stories out there circulated, those sound bites, those clips to where the, the voter is more educated and we make it easy on them because if we put it on the voter, they're gonna do this in 10 minutes and they're gonna nominate their friends. Good points. Um, at one point there was, before I started here, they had a rule in place where you couldn't win the award if you won it the year before. Good, bad, indifferent. I agree. I agree with that. And I was, I was about to say that there should be a limit on it because like I said, um, the, the guy here, he wins every year. I mean, come on, this, this guy, he's, he's a really good sports writer. I don't even think he writes for a newspaper anymore. He, he does a lot of freelance writing, but his name is so popular here. He wins every year. It's, I think there should be a limit to it. No doubt. about it. Ben Scully won 30, 33 times in California. And gentleman by the name of, I think it's Bob Curtis, won 
a like number of times in Idaho. For hey Dominic, you uh, you had a, a message in chat. You want to elaborate on that? Want to unmute and give us your thoughts? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, my name is Dominic Petrello. I'm a, a blind writer from New Jersey. Um, I was just saying, instead of having people uh, vote on a nomination, like to say, oh, I want to, I want to nominate John Smith, or I want to vote uh, nominate Antonio, whoever, that they should, that maybe you and maybe the committee uh, should come up with the list of nominees yourself, so you can make sure it's diverse and you find the best people, and it's not just a, you know, good old boys club where it's just everybody's nominating their friends and then send out the uh, nomination list to everybody instead of asking for nominations from people. I think that could be, be helpful. So you, you would need people, at least one person in each state to consult with. Correct. Because if it's just, well, I mean, take, for instance, California, somebody in LA might not give people in Northern California or vice versa, or people in New York might not worry about upstate or people in Philly might not worry about Pittsburgh. So might need a couple. So might have to put together a, a large committee. It's not a bad uh, suggestion. Um, how, uh, Dave, question, sure. how close is it like, is it close very often to there being more women and minorities on the ballot like they finish third or fourth and yeah just you know i would have to i would have to go back through i would i would think there are probably fewer sports writer and obviously i don't know every sports writer in in the country but you know i, I try to keep an eye out and you know to gary's point we do we try to do five daily links on our website to my priority and I tell if I have interns here, it's sports media news and then sports news and, and try to showcase different people. I usually get most of it if I'm doing it, it's from whatever my Twitter feed is showing. So, you know, it could depend on timing and all that. Um, I mean, where, there are, where I was going with that was, is there an opportunity that something could be included where you could have discretion to include more than the top two to increase diversity. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I'm a little leery of me taking the, having that kind of power just because I don't want to be the one to determine. But you're not deciding who get people then end up voting for. You're deciding who their options are to vote for. I will bring that up with some of my board members who are in the industry and see what they think about that. That's not, I don't think that's a bad suggestion. Lauren, what input do you have as you're hopefully paying attention to the road? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I think all really great points. And, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, being nominated and chosen, um, gosh, I guess my first year was what, 2015, I think. I'd have I to look back so. and then, yeah, 2015 and then 2018. So uh, I will say that obviously here in Alabama, um, the Southeast uh, Regional Emmys, I guess, became another thing on the radar. And what's interesting is before I was actually nominated and or chosen for NSMA, um, it was back when you guys were, uh, I can't even remember, what was it, NS NSS? A, is that right? Correct. National, yeah. So that was before the name change. Um, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of the organization. I wasn't aware of, you know, the possibilities. So we, as broadcast journalists, so I was working at a local CBS affiliate at the time when I'd won the award, was only aware of like the AP awards, the Abbey awards, which is more specific to the state of Alabama, um, and then the Southeast Emmys. And so that was always kind of at the forefront. And I do think that uh, in, in being nominated and chosen for an Emmy award, I've been to one of those award banquets and see a lot of the same things where it's literally the same person over and over and over and over again. And you look at some of the work that, um, you know, you might, I guess, I guess the one thing I get, you know, if we're talking about an overall theme, which is like best sports anchor or best, whatever, you're seeing a compilation of things, but 
you know, you do kind of wonder like, uh, obviously how people are winning over and over and over again. So how do you diversify that? And I love the ideas because I do think that in some ways, um, it is a lot of just check that box, uh, you know, not doing the research, you know, in Alabama, obviously, um, you know, I work for AL.com now, the Birmingham news market and, you know, those are the people that I'm typically, uh, you know, aware of their work. I know, you know, how long they've been in the market. And so I do think that in some ways you kind of have to, to maybe like have more pointed criteria. And I don't know if it's something where it's like some sort of survey model or something that allows, uh, you know, like you said, putting, putting like top three, best three pieces of work, right? So, you know, if nominations were done by a committee, per se, let's just say each state has a committee of maybe, you know, four people or whatever it ends up being. And then once those nominations are made, the, 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 the nominations that are made select, you know, okay, now I've been nominated, I'm going to give you my three best, most prided pieces of work for this year. Um, you know, so then you're gauging it on this year and not, you know, the last 10 years or, you know, it's, it becomes that redundant theme. And I'm with you. I think that, you know, when you nominate people and they win it year after year after year, it just kind of makes you wonder like, all right, you know, is it even worth being a part of this? And, and is it worth, um, even, you know, putting my name in the hat and it just kind of becomes an obsolete thing. And, but then I also know there's a lot of other people out there that have never won and have constantly been like, oh, you know, like I was nominated, but so-and-so won it again. And, you know, there's a lot of comparisons and I think some frustration, you know, from the outside of people just wondering, like, what is it going to take for me to have my opportunity and get my shot at winning? And really, what does that process look like? Because people on the outside don't know. People on the outside that aren't necessarily voters don't know what that's like. I didn't know, obviously, until I was chosen for the award. And then, of course, you know, became a member and was part of that. So I do think that the transparency of that and then obviously some adjustments that can be made will really give, you know, a look at that diversity and to give more people, um, you know, an opportunity, uh, you know, the minority group and or women to be able to have those, you know, have those opportunities and, and what is the criteria that we're looking at, um, you know, from a writer standpoint at, as well as a broadcast standpoint. And also, too, as we know, a lot of the media outlets are also, you know, cross pollinating in terms of the content they're putting out. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at AL.com, right, I'm, I'm a digital reporter. I do primarily video. I don't do a lot of writing. I don't do much writing at all. Most of mine is video analysis. But we do have a lot of writers now that transcend on both sides. And so I would just be curious to know, like, how you handle the cross pollination of things and with more writers becoming more active in video roles and more active in creative content, um, you know, being able to highlight some of that stuff, you know, the versatility part of it, I think is huge and being able to kind of see that. And personally, I would love to see these people's work, right? Um, you know, there's not enough time in the day to go research every single person that comes down the pipeline, but I think that's one thing that is missing from this process is not getting to see that. So at least with the Emmy Awards or, you know, the Abbeys, the APs, whatever it is, typically uh, when you have the awards banquet, you would see like a clip of some, some of their work, right? Well, obviously I know there's not nearly enough time to do that in every state, but giving people that opportunity to see their work, um, you know, allows you to get to know them. I want to know people on the other side. I want to get to know the, even though they're considered competitors of the company I work for, I want to get to know those people and their work and, and be able to applaud them and their successes. Uh, and I think having, having that accessible to us and available, it would definitely take a lot more legwork, but um, that, that to me would be very important. Good points. And, and any, I'll put it out here now. If anybody has suggestions, they want to email me, please feel free. Um, Kai Dombach, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Um, so for, for those who don't know me, I'm Kai, and I am a Bundesliga commentator here in Germany. Um, so I just, I just, I was just curious, and I recognize this is completely self-serving, but has there ever been a category for American uh, reporters and commentators working uh, outside of the United States? There has not, but uh, that has been something I have thought about. So, okay. 
maybe something in the future. Um, okay. But you would have, it was you'd have to commit to fly here from Germany if you want. I mean, I'm more. fine with that. Very yeah, good. no problem. I was actually considering doing that next year. Cool. Um, Gary, are, are you are you optimistic in the numbers of people of color who are coming into the business and starting? A, you're starting to see some people getting into management, um, not only on the sports side but managing editors. I I just saw a tweet that. Uh, one gentleman is coming back to Raleigh to run the Raleigh News and Observer as managing editor. Are you seeing that? Uh, here and there, but no, I'm not really optimistic. Um, I guess with this, you know, all the events of this summer, there's been kind of a, a renewed uh, vigor to try to, to diversify staffs. And I think that's happening slowly. Um, I, I still don't think we uh, people of color uh, are at an advantage in terms of getting jobs over uh, their white counterparts when their white counterparts don't know them. Um, I'm still getting the question, how do I find good candidates of color, um, which I think is a real bad excuse. I just think that's unacceptable for editors to ask that. I mean, when you have resources like the National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, there's so many good journalists of color and women that you should not have a shortage, a list. Uh, you should not tell me or someone I don't know how to find uh, quality, qualified candidates of color. I think the what we're downplaying and people are downplaying is the importance of awards like this to, to resumes, um, how this enhances your resume. This helps people of color potentially get better jobs when you say you're the national uh, or uh, NMS, NSMA Sports Writer of the Year in your state. I mean, that's, that's definitely a resume builder. And we can't, and we just can't take this lightly. Our voters are taking this way too lightly. And I said, like, I, they're just people who are getting this award every year and they're opening up their little drawer and they're flipping the trophy in and they're closing it. And, you know, it's like, we're taking this for granted. And there's, there would be a lot of people out there who would win, who would be so happy and proud and would wanna represent your or, the organization and wanna encourage, but if we, if we don't, give them an opportunity to even have a chance to win, it's gonna be the same old, we're, it's gonna be a merry-go-round, we're riding the same, this is the same situation. Um, you've gotta give people encouragement, um, especially younger journalists now, because they're not, they're not as patient as, uh, as our generation was. They, they right. you know, if, they, if, they, if, they, if it's not for them and they feel left out, they're not gonna keep knocking on the door to try to be part of it. Um, and that's the thing. You've got to try to get younger journalists involved. And if this is considered or stereotypically a white guy's organization, you're not going to mm -hmm. you're not going to attract people of color, right. um, especially younger people of color. You're just not and women of and women. You're just not. Um, so we have to do something to encourage people to uh, want to be part of it. Um, and as said, it, it, it enhances your resume and. I, I think as Lauren was saying, like you got people winning the award who was just like, and Rob was saying like, who just, oh, thanks, appreciate it. And they're, you know, they're not, they're, they've won it 12 times. They've won it 22 times. Like anything you do 22 times, is not gonna be like the first. <laughs> right. And so uh, we're, we have people taking it for granted. Oh, thanks. You know, you, you would have people, I think the first timers who would actually come to North Carolina, come to the award ceremony, bring their family, bring their mother, because they'd be like, they'd be love it. And that's what you want, right? You want enthusiasm. You don't want the same old ga guys and gals winning because you've got people winning who have won 28 other awards from 28 other organizations. No offense, it's nice, but they're gonna be like, oh, thanks, what is this? Right. Whoa, preach, all right. G g appreciate it. Hey, all right. I, I won't be there, but you know, I'm there in spirit and, and at the awards, you know, and, and they keep it moving, which is fine. That's some people have re got to that level where they've that's who they are and that's what they can do. But right. then there's a lot of people, you know, veteran journalists who would just love one award and would 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 really love that and would really you know, it would enhance their careers. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to like, not only, you know, award each other, but spread the wealth a little bit. And I, I think that's the, that's the problem. And that mm -hmm. way you get more participation, you get more enthusiasm, you get more membership, therefore you make more money. But is that what 
in SMA should be trying to do is like, just in general, it shouldn't be recognized the best journalists, like it, spreading the wealth and like, I'm not sure that's what the awards should be trying to do is spread I, the wealth. I think, but I think there's a lot of talent that did, this gets completely ignored. And I think there's a lot of repeat winners who just didn't have a great year. They're getting it on reputation. And I'm not saying that there's not, you know, uh, great uh, veteran journalists who should win it every year, but you know, Michael Jordan didn't win the MVP every year. There's other, there's, you know, uh, we have to recognize some of the people that work in these small towns. I work for, a, a, I'm a member of another, a New England based organization and we did a judging of awards. And there's some amazing stories from people that I've never, I hadn't heard of. And they should get recognized also. I'm not talking about like, if they don't deserve it, but we've got to throw some names out there. We got to have some fresh faces and new names. At the New England Newspapers uh, Association. Yeah. And I, ju I judged that last last year at this time. I think I'm still paying, I'm still paying a subscription from I don't know where. <laughs> um, so Gary, do you think we should reinstitute that? You can't if you won the year before, you can, you're not eligible to win the next year. No, I mean two people, people could have back to back good years. I don't know about that. Um, I don't know, maybe three or four in a row or something. I don't want to stop great journalists from, from deter their greatness. I right. just think we have to, it, it's from the ground roots of having to get new names to, to in, in front of people who are literally nominating. So, cause I don't think, I don't think people are in purpose saying, I don't like any, I don't know you, so I'm not going to nominate you. I think people just do it out of natural comfort. And we have to get people out of their comfort zone. And I think people are open to that. How, how about names of potential Hall of Famers coming up that are people of color, especially on the sports writing side? I mean, I can, I can envision on the sports casting side, certainly Stuart Scott, uh, Stephen A. Um, how about on the sports writer side? Yeah, there's a lot of guys. I mean, William Roden should have been in the Hall of Fame already. I mean, we, David Aldridge is a, it's a, is a Hall of Fame. There's a lot of guys uh, and gals. I mean, Claire Smith should already be in. I mean, it's kind of, it's ridiculous to me, you know, uh, that some of these folks are still not in, um, that have had 40 plus year careers of excellence. Um, and I know these things take a while, I'm not blaming anybody, but um, there's, a, there's a list of, of veteran sports writers who could be, who are who, who are should be qualified for the Hall of Fame? Um, you know, some of them are retired. Some of them are still still active. Yeah, I mean, I th personally, I think the the list of ten finalists, at least on the sports writer side, I don't know that you can make an argument against any one of those ten for being in. You know, um, Eric, you know, on the L LGBTQ side. You know, I, I can tell if a person's skin is darker than mine. I can tell if you're a woman. I can't necessarily tell if you fit one of those categories. How, how do we make sure we are um, open to, to everybody? I'm not sure there's a good way to suggest that. I, wanted, I do want to commend in 2018, I actually did a story on this, uh, both Steph Lowe and Chris Hine won state uh, sports writers of the year as LGBT people. Um, uh, Steph though is, oh, Steph Lowe is no, is no longer working in sports, uh, but yeah, Chris Hine still is in Minnesota. I don't think he's a finalist this year. Um, Like, I don't know that people need to be recognized because they're LGBT, but, um, and there's not the same, like, sports division within NLGGA that I know the uh, um, NABJ has. Um, so there's there's not really the outreach there. Um, it'd just be great to, like, the person that I'm surprised isn't considered each year is Chuck Culpepper. Like uh, that's LGBT. Like he does incredible work at the Washington Post. I don't. I don't remember seeing him um, ever be a finalist, which is surprising to me. He may have been like in a previous, uh, like a while ago when he was like in Oregon or 
Kentucky or something, but like, I don't right. remember recently. I want to say I have seen it and it's been a while, but I remember seeing his name a while back and I don't know whether it was, I don't think he won a state award. He may have. And I look at those occasionally and, and you know, 50 some odd years of, or 60 years of most states, that's a lot of thousands. So I, I don't have them memorized, but uh, you know, I, I definitely, in fact, there is a gentleman who works in on this floor uh, in one of the nonprofits. Uh, I think Chuck is his, what do you tell me? Second cousin, maybe. So we've had discussions about Chuck. Um, as, far, JJ, well, as far as broadcasters, yeah in the hall of fame, like Rob and Roberts would be someone that I think mm -hmm. would be a great, uh, LGBT representative in the hall of fame. Um, and I know she's on the list of the larger lists. Yeah. And as far as sports editor or sports writers for the hall of fame possibilities, um, Sid Ziegler and, uh, Jim Bazinski are actually going into, uh, NLGJA hall, went into the NLGJA hall of fame this year for their work mm -hmm. without sports and, those two would be definitely a pair to consider in the future for the for the Hall of Fame on the sports writer side. Great, thank you. Um, about fifteen minutes left. Um, any I other suggestions? I, I wanted Hello. to add. I, I was just thinking, like, I don't know, you know, thinking out loud because obviously, I think the goal is twofold. Obviously, to bring in, um, you know, diverse members, a group of members. Um, you know, from all over the country, because obviously it's not just about winning the award, right? It's a part, it's also part of being part of this organization. And I think sometimes that might be also where, you know, uh, the whole concept and thought process, um, I guess was, I, I think it was you, Gary, that was talking about this, but specifically, you know, the process that, you, you know, you win the award 20 times, you just throw it in a drawer. Well, obviously, um, you know, I think that, that is probably also a byproduct of the fact that, you know, you have this organization, there's this annual award being given out, and then that's kind of it, you know, the communication. And obviously, a part of that's not, I mean, some of that's not on you guys specifically. A lot of that's just on people having lives and certainly, you know, kind of, you know, living their own lives, living in their bubble. And then when that annual award comes around year to year, but I think that some people just, I guess, recognize it differently you know it's just again another award it gets thrown in a drawer I know for me personally like I was like blown away when I got nominated the first time and I was like whoa I didn't even know about this thing and then you know the second time around I was just as excited and you know obviously I'd experienced the first class hospitality and everything that went on with the awards banquet but for people to to recognize the magnitude of this award and, you know, to just have that understanding of it, I think is a big part of it. And then too, you know, just, I, I don't know, I think getting people more involved in, in the organization, I think can be also another byproduct of, of obviously diversifying the roster and getting people recognized that, you know, aren't, you know, the ones that you see year in and year out, right? Mm -hmm. and being able to kind of help that cause. And so I don't know, I think there's some ideas, you know, things that things that we could do to certainly bring attention to that. But I don't know what that is specifically, but I do think that having more involvement, I think what you've been doing obviously with these Zoom meetings and just doing a lot more in terms of, of community outreach. But, you know, I think that some people, maybe more of the veterans in the company or veterans in the uh, broadcast industry or, you know, uh, sports industry, you know, probably just kind of look at it as sort of another thing, right? Well, I find that you're sort of young, aspiring journalists, those that are kind of new, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, have a lot more excitement around it. So how do you generate that excitement for whether you're 18, 20 years old, just graduated in college, on up to being a Hall of Famer, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just kind of my thought process is, is being able to almost put, you know, shine light on this organization in such a way that gets people involved. And then too, I think it does recognize people's work and people can see their work and sort of maybe be part of that process, right? How do you make it exciting? Um, you know, when you 
Now, I, I don't have any votes in the Heisman process. I don't have any votes in the AP or any of that stuff. But, you know, seeing that process and, and better understanding how people go about doing that, um, you know, I, I would be interested in knowing that. Like when you're voting for, for, for a Heisman Trophy winner, you know, what is some of the criteria that you're looking at that you take some of that personal thing out of it, right? Just because you've hated Ohio State your entire life, does that mean that's you're not going to vote for Justin Fields? And so I guess that's sort of my thought process is may, maybe incorporating some of the other voting processes and generating some of that interest. And how do you do that by putting the people you're voting for, you know, out there to see their work again and, and you know, finding ways to really, you know, maybe spotlight those journalists um, could also get more people involved. And I think the more people you get involved in the voting process, the more people I think that you eventually are going to be able to reach and hopefully diversify the roster of of nominations and or, um, you know, winners each year. I don't know if that makes sense. I I know I'm kind of rambling, but thinking out loud, you know, as as I think the process can definitely evolve to a place where more people want to be involved and have a better understanding of just the magnitude of this, this, this organization that you've worked so hard to build and create, because I mean, it is, it is substantial and, you know, I, I want everybody to feel that, you know. Good points. Thank you. Um, James, you're in South Dakota. You've, you've won the sports writer of the year award. Um, how, how is, how is the, maybe not the organization, but the award specifically looked upon in the state of South Dakota, or at least where you are? What, do, what does well, that mean? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that Jeremy and I both have our awards, uh, prominently displayed and we're, and yes, we are both up again. Um, the one, the one of the four that uh, hasn't won it, uh, that as far as finalists is the one is the one uh, person of color, Brian. Uh, Brian, who I, I'll be honest, I mean, he's he's definitely uh, worth an option um, in terms of how it's re- received. Um, I'd say the some of the some of the uh, characterizations are pretty pretty accurate there's a lot of a lot of old boys I mean I think Brian's the uh, I mean Brian's definitely the youngest by uh, sports writer or sports caster in there and he's 30 and I'm I'm on there because everybody knows me I mean I've been at the same paper for 28 years and I'd put myself I mean, I'd honestly put myself fourth of the four uh, Point for honesty. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I put myself second on my stuff. I know Jer- Jeremy does great work. So does Ryan in in Mitchell and Brian uh, in Sioux Falls. And kind of this, I mean, it's kind of a mix with that on the uh, on the sports caster as well. You've got a couple of younger guys that I mean, early thirties that have been been doing pretty well here for for the last eight nine years. One one older one that's that's gotten it once or twice before, and I'm trying to remember who the fourth one is. Because it's um, uh, John Thayer, uh, Jay Elson, Tim Smith, and is it Duffy? Jeff Duffy, correct. Jeff Duffy, okay, and he's an, another older one that's won it before as well. But uh, but yeah, so there's kind of a mix, and it I mean in terms of how it's not talked about a lot, but I know the guys that have won, won it have appreciated it. That's for sure. Well, it's, it's, you know, for me, and this is, this is just me when I took over this job and I saw that there are so many people in the Dakotas who are members and voting. And, and my, I guess my, my image is that maybe in some of the bigger States, it's like, yeah, cool. I won this award, but maybe in the Dakotas, where you, where it's regarded as flyover country, that it is a bigger deal. In a smaller oh, yeah. state, and smaller state, and we kind of kind of all know each other. I I hard to I'm using this year's group as an example. I mean, Jay uh, Jay and John are the are the radio and TV guys for the University of South Dakota. Jeremy and Brian. Are our beat writers on the University of South Dakota, and I shoot a lot of those games. So that's that's more than half your nominees right there. 
and, and then awareness of, for me, ideally, this is a vote of peer respect and those of us in the business should know the people who do what we do. So Gary mentioned, you know, there are other cities in Massachusetts other than Boston. There's a newspaper in Springfield and Worcester. And you know, I'm, I started my career at the Taunton Daily Gazette circulation 15,000, I think. Um, do you guys have awareness of most of the outlets in your state and the people who are doing oh, yeah. what they I mean, do? There's nine or 10 daily news, well, close, what were daily newspapers before uh, before this year? Um, I mean, Mitchell's down to twice a week, but, and then we're, I mean, most of the papers in the state have reduced their publication, but all, all of us are all pretty well connected. Um, I mean, I've talked to in person just about every one of my counterparts at, at the other papers. Aberdeen, I haven't because she's new. She's also the only, as far as I know, she's the only female in, uh, sports writer in South Dakota right now, uh, full time that is. And there aren't a lot of female, you know, female sports casters in South Dakota right now either. Anybody have any questions? Jay, JD, Dominic, Neil, any questions, Rob? Well, I just, I just want to say, you know, as a, as a black sportscaster, I, I really appreciate this conversation. And um, maybe if you send, you know, information to uh, some of the HBCUs or most of the HBCUs, because most of the HBCUs have play-by-play -play men who are black people. And, um, and I, I, I got to tell you, man, when I won the award, everybody here was so excited that Jackson State gave me an award for winning that award. <laughs> so, <laughs> Love it. So it's, it's, it's exciting. And that's why I joined. Yeah. And one of the things I did in the last one, I guess I've been an, uh, an awesome member for a couple of years. I joined NABJ last year and was really, I think, I don't know if it was you, Gary, that I talked to, but suggested I come to the business meeting. I was really looking forward to coming to DC this year and look what happened. So hopefully we'll get that done. But I think um, I'm guessing you would tell me that going in and recruiting there would be a worthwhile option and just to present what we do and how we can help. I mean, that's our dual mission is not only honoring excellence, but as Lauren said, we, we try to connect the younger generation so they can, as someone once famously said, take our jobs one day. So it's uh, certainly a worthwhile thing. Um, JD? It, and you just hit on it is uh, working for the actual university here is uh, right now we're in that overlap with football, basketball going same time. But I'm, I'm fortunate in that moving forward, I'm not going to be doing radio for basketball, baseball. I'm just going to be doing ESPN and ESPN plus and three or whatever they want to put it on is I'm passionate about trying to get plugged into our comm department about trying to bring that chapter to this campus, getting them plugged in with you uh, because, you know, it's not, th th there's a, there's a lot of different cultural profiles uh, and diversity there. And, and we're, you know, sensitive to all of that as a university campus. And we want to want to bring everybody in, especially when they're young, uh, because that's part of our, you know, our charge as, as members. And uh, I'm excited about trying to get that connection. And, and I think where we'll see some success here when we can actually carve out time to do it is our communications department at the University of South Alabama is now coming to the athletic department more and more, trying to get more practical uh, engagement and, and practicum uh, through us. And, uh, and they're seeing the fruits of that with their participation in ESPN Plus on the production side. And, and my colleague, Pat, who's in the office next to me, does a great job of managing the students, coaching the students, but also he doesn't let them get comfortable in the role. As soon as they get good at one thing, he slides them. He's like, all right, now you go get on camera. And, and, and he's even teaching a class or two. And uh, I think he's gonna do a 400 level in the spring. So they really like what he's doing over there. Um, so I'm, I, I hope, hopefully that'll happen here in Mobile. Cool. Um, let's go around to our, anybody else have a question or, or comment? Question for our panelists. Dominic, you got anything for us?
Uh, no, I think everything's good. I'm just excited to be able to be here and to uh, listen to everything that's going on. And I know uh, being, uh, yes, I'm, you know, a 40 year old white guy, but I'm also completely blind. So I feel uh, not only inspired, but a particular fascination, and everything with what's going on with, you know, the women and the minorities as well, because being blind, I'm definitely part of that because people don't want to, you know, work with or hire, even uh, give a look at, you know, the blind writer either. All right. Let me just go around to our three panelists before we, we close here. Um, Eric, you want to give me an assignment uh, for the next year, what I can do to make this, uh, this better and more inclusive? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 the, the suggestion I made earlier is the step I th or at least looking into it that I think might be the best is see if there's someone within a spot or two of being in the final two that to increase diversity and who people can vote for on their final ballot. See, maybe take it to your board and see their thoughts on that. Lauren, how about you? What can I do to make this organization better and more inclusive? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, again, I, I go back to, to, I guess what Gary said at the top, I think that being able to see examples of work just makes such a big difference. Um, you know, I, I would love to see just more, you know, more uh, people and get to understand what they do, uh, you know, on a vast level. And that's obviously on the, the state scale as well as the national level. I think that that's so important, the examples of work. Um, and again, I think figuring out a way to implement that's going to be huge and can definitely, you know, ha have a natural effect on the diversity and obviously what we're able to implement in the process of, um, you know, bringing more people on board, getting more excitement surrounding it and just, uh, you know, taking things to the next level. I mean, but, you know, Dave, you, you do a really good job and have always done a good job. And ever since I've known you the last several years, um, you know, I applaud you for, all the hard work you put in and, and what you do to recognize the talent, um, you know, uh, across the country. I know that it's not easy. Uh, there's a lot of people involved, a lot of moving parts and, you know, a lot of challenges that come with it. So, you know, I certainly hope you know that it's very much appreciated. And, um, you know, I think, I think we all know we're all a work in progress. So I think we just keep working and evolving and this process will keep evolving and, um, you know, I think it definitely wouldn't hurt to, to, you know, reach out to folks within, you know, members and whatnot to kind of figure out, find out ways that they may, um, you know, if there's a survey that can be done to kind of better understand what works, what doesn't, and how it can evolve and things can be done differently. Thank you. And thank you for those words. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of not always doing things the way they've always been done just because. So thank you for that. Gary, last word's yours. Um, I thank just, you, by the way. I just think uh, if you can, I mean, I know you know people in every state, reach out to someone in every state and just try to get some, some names of people who are really talented and they don't necessarily have to be people of color, but you know, I worked with a guy in California named Eric Sondheimer, who is a high school institution in Southern California. I mean, he should be in someone's hall of fame I think he was already inducted into the Los Angeles City Section Hall of Fame, and he's a he's a person I would think would 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 surely be nominated. There's there's names that people have of people that are doing good work, and it might not necessarily be covering pro sports or even college mm -hmm. sports. Sometimes mm -hmm. high school sports, community sports, uh, things like that, or doing smaller uh, being the pre play by play person for a smaller college who who's been someone's been there a long time that might not get the recognition. Um, but I think if you kind of talk to people in every state and get names, I think, as, as James was saying, everybody in South Dakota knows each other. And, and the more you get into, you know, you, you live in a state, you get to know people from around your state where you see them in the arenas or whatever, and you, and you know and you notice their work. And I think that way you get new names in there uh, and then people to, people to approach for membership. You know, not only to nominate for awards, but for membership, because I think mm -hmm. there's people who are interested who are just unsure right. uh, whether, you know, or how much does it cost or what does that what, what, what does that mean for me? You know, in, 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 as opposed to just well, look at the website, you know, 
right. maybe reach out to them. But I think reaching out to someone in every state, getting some names, um, and w I think will be a good start. Well, Eric and Lauren and Gary, I appreciate your time today. The rest of you, thank you for your comments and thanks for uh, tuning in. Again, thanks to Greater Winston-Salem Inc. who uh, makes these all possible. I, I love doing these, these are fun. It takes a little while to put together, but that's okay. Work, hard work never hurt anybody, right? Guys, have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Good to see thanks everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to be on the panel, Dave. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Gary. See ya. <laughs>